Hello, I am back with uh, Dan Icott, and Dan is co-founder of The Content Creatives, and I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about video, its place, social media, events, everything that I was going to say, Dan, you're embroiled in, but I'm sure it's not embroiled in. So, uh, Dan, thank you for being a victim and coming on to this. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, so you're you're doing a lot you're a lot heavily involved in video uh, you've been there for a long time how have you seen video change in terms of its consumption over the last say two three years very good question so i suppose as this will be known the last few years will be known as the lockdown years um mm -hmm. we've seen a shift between um everyone expecting sort of high-end super high quality video to um, more user generated content so you know stuff that we're doing now doing things remotely um, don't have to go into the big fancy tv studios um, and have that sort of glossy look and kind of go to this more reality real mm -hmm. um, vibe um, and in during lockdown a lot of uh, companies big and small were forced to make their own content and audiences didn't turn off they probably engage with it probably more in my opinion um, because it offered a completely different way to tell a company's story. Um, you don't, you know, most people only want to see the glitz and glamour, but for people like myself, I love seeing how things work. I like seeing behind the scenes mm. and user generated content normally allows that more natural vibe, which I think helps connect with people because everyone knows everything isn't perfect. Mm. Um, so it's nice to see just exactly how yeah, things and work. And TikTok's done very well off people making their own videos, haven't they? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, TikTok went, well it went viral i mean you know it's a platform to go viral on, but tiktok really um took off during um the pandemic because like you say user generated content where do you put it uh instagram um and tiktok so uh, loads of people took to it um it's, you could easily grow a following um finding your little niche um super short videos um i know they i know now that they've done the 10 minute you know up to 10 minute version to try and maybe take on YouTube a bit, but I don't think, I think that'll be a little while before people really start accepting long videos on TikTok because the point of it is you've got about 10, 15 seconds, like it and keep on scrolling. And the aspect, I mean, I know we're going kind of off topic a little bit, but one of the things for me is the aspect ratio of TikTok. I still mm. can't quite get my head around it. Oh, as in ver uh, doing everything vertically? Yeah. Yeah, so I must admit, having done like video production and film production since I was about 13 years old, always having everything in that rectangle, uh, that's where I kind of feel safe. And when the world started to change and start to go like this, um, it did take me a little bit because I'm like, that's not, you know, that's just not how it's been done before. Um, but I am really embracing more smartphone um, storytelling and um vertical video just because on those platforms it, it's clear there's an audience for it because if people didn't like vertical videos tiktok wouldn't have exploded the way it did um but it also allows i think what i like about, about it most is to do the sort of rough raw organic content people are so used to taking a selfie now um yeah. and just being able to hold their phone instead of looking down the, the barrel of a lens on a dslr or a camcorder people feel really comfortable FaceTiming friends and family, again, especially during lockdowns. So now for them to go into selfie mode and, you know, rattle off a two, three minute monologue about something that they're really passionate about or just updating you about their life or even just wishing someone happy birthday in person as opposed to writing on a wall on a social media site. I just think that's been really, um, it's, it's game changing to storytelling, really. I think, you know, I remember, I can't claim the quote, but somebody said, like, and this is before the lockdown years, we can't say the P word on YouTube. So uh, before the lockdown years, somebody said that every business is a media company. And I, do you know what? I think through that period, that's become not just like should be, has to be. Hmm. And now almost everybody, every business in one way, shape or form is creating content or is a media company that also happens to sell stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not, no, it's not. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been 
self-employed straight out of university and I've always been explaining to people like the power of video and why companies shouldn't see it as a luxury, more of a necessity and a, an integral part of their marketing strategy and plan. Um, purely because being the age that I was and talking with all the you know business owners that have got 10, 20, 30 years experience over me, you know, I was like, so you grew up with the internet or your business business evolved to the internet. Well, now, like the new generations, they're going to social media platforms, predominantly through picture and video. So for you to sort of keep up with that market, video is a really good way to sort of get you established in that in that area. And for example, if you know selling carpets or vacuum cleaners or whatever, if you're one of the early adopters on that, you're probably going to do quite well in the age group that I that I fall into and younger because you haven't got any competition with it. Um, and every company does have a story. Um, that is one of like one of our con- lines at content creators is, you know, your story matters and you might not understand that you have a story because you're too busy being the best at selling carpets, vacuum cleaners, birthday cakes, whatever it may be. Um, but there's definitely a story there and it's video is the best delivery mechanism in my opinion, as a fan of videos, like I, I love to consume cinema, watch Netflix as well as making it for the day job. I just think it's the best platform and the easiest way to kind of get a relationship going with someone that you've not met potentially on the other side of the globe. And they're just things that you just happen to meet because they're interested in your product. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked kind of in TV, so I've been the other side of the camera. I don't personally like doing video. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, you do become aware of yourself as you're doing it. I mean, I, as you were talking, I glanced and caught myself and I was like, Oh, I need to adjust my camera and all this kind of stuff. It it is an unsettling thing to do, Mm. but I know the connection you get to something through video is different to imagery or stills or anything like the connection is deeper Mm. because you know, you write a post, you know, and put a social media post up or you write an article and that's like, there's no, there's no gauge way to gauge the personality, how, how people express themselves. The ideas yep. don't come across. Yep. I mean, I know he's a divisive character, but you look at like Jordan Peterson who's kind of blown up because he put his lectures, which are quite dry to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. on youtube and some people love them mm. and he's i must admit i've seen some of them yep they are quite dry aren't they there's no like sensationalism there's no like flashy lights or anything it's him talking to a webcam yeah so i i, I think there is a me um, a deeper experience that you get from video that you can't replicate in any other way i think that I suppose just from a sensory point of view, video is, you've got to listen to it, you're looking at it, so you're engaging with it on two of your senses, which um, a lot of other marketing tools, you don't really get that. So if it's, if it's paper, you're, you're, as you say, you're looking at it, but you might be hearing your favourite song in the background, so you're not engaging with it enough. And I think um, engagement and connection is probably why I think video is so powerful in, in whatever message you're trying to deliver, just because you are you can't really half listen to a video if you're like, if it's on, you've got to have good audio, good picture. You've got most people, you know, listening to and watching what, what you want uh, them to see where print media and purely audio media, they are great as supporting, but video mm-hmm. kind of just gets you on, ambushes you on a couple of fronts basically in a nice way. And people like watching it, um, mm-hmm. writing posts, as you say, um, I don't like written word because you don't understand the context, as you said. If you're having a bad day, you can read one email or one blog post and have a totally different connection to it if you had a good morning um, because of the way you interpret the words. And that's why it's really difficult to get personality across. But as you say, a lot of people can be a bit sceptical slash not scared, more worried about putting themselves on, on camera because they are being vulnerable and having to be themselves with people. But by doing that, you are essentially making the connection that, you know, it would take like a hundred blog posts or yeah. 50 photos to get to that same kind of level. So, you know, a 90 second talking head video like we're doing now can go so much further than 
all of your other that, marketing put together. That lens is like a mirror for your insecurities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and depending on what kind of uh, lens or equipment you're using, you can actually see yourself as well if you really focus in on it. So that can be a bit off putting as well. <laughs> yeah. So the one thing that, that, and I don't know whether you've picked up this in, in what you do, is um, I used to find, you know, when people say, oh, we've got an on a conference and it's going to be live broadcast online, I'm like, well, I don't want to go to that. Mm -hmm. But then the lockdown, and it was like, oh, I can still go to that. And now some things it's like, yeah, I don't want to travel for that. It's kind of flipped it the other way around. Have you found this, that actually some of the stuff that you would never watch online, people now want to watch online because of what's happened? Yeah, 100%. I think it's actually quite interesting that society shift towards video became so much stronger because of the lockdowns um and like you say um how many businesses have probably become so much more efficient in saving money but also productivity because you know i'm guilty of it i used to go into to london to meet a few clients that's three or four hours out of my day but now i can click a button i can talk to them for 45 minutes and i've just gained two hours of my day um so with things like conferences you know if people go do you want to go in person or watch it online they would go oh, i'd rather go for the experience but when you're in lockdown you're actually looking for things to do and transport yourself into these other worlds so going to a conference uh, uh, virtually was actually something to look forward to so i think the power of video there is kind of shifted a lot of people's mindsets on how it can be used practically um, and also productively. Because I think a lot of people would say, if we've got a conference and we got, you know, 500,000 people or 200 people in the room, that's fantastic. And often they record it, but what do they do with it? But this has kind of created a new mm. dimension of, I've got, I've got the audience in the room, I could broadcast it and get another audience, a bigger audience, but also I can reuse that content. And I think a lot of people didn't know how to re, you know, we've done a conference, let's put it on YouTube and it'll sit there and get 43 views. Yes. Actually now more people are thinking, okay, this conference, this one day conference, two day conference is now actually a bank of content for the next year. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So one of the things that I've always tried to practice um, since being self-employed is trying to use video as part of a strategy is obviously the most easiest way to be super successful. But um, also I'm always looking for just my natural storytelling mindset is always, although someone says I want to tell story A, you can normally find a good story B, C, D, depending on you know the situation and what exactly is happening. So the good thing about video and events is um yes you can do it live stream now you can either just have it as one webcam at the back of the room you know quite boring or you can have it quite dynamic you can have multiple cameras so you can kind of do a like a live vision mix to make it look more tv-esque just mm -hmm. to try and keep audience attention if you if you're looking at the same clip or the same angle for a long period of time eventually you can't help it no matter how beautiful the background or the person who is on screen that may be talking eventually you do start to wonder mm -hmm. so just by having a second angle or, or third angle to cut between just kind of brings people back into the room just re mm -hmm. it makes them re-engage um and also like people would just stream it once and leave it where i would i've always said well we can repurpose that so now we can put um so an event we we put on just before lot lockdown actually um we did an event at city hall london living room and it was a panel around helping getting young people into digital uh, media work and employment so we had three panels so we've got the three panels online we also cut up some of the the content to send out to people that was on a particular subject so we've got this 45 minute panel that can become lots of smaller mini panels uh, discussions um to put on your different social medias um you've got your photographs um you can do the audio into a podcast so basically it's just trying to work how how smart we can be with the content to put it out on all the different platforms you have because as you know as we've said tiktok and reels now really big and that's vertical so if you want to do some stuff like that you just got to tinker with the footage a little bit to make it fit for purpose on that platform and i think 
at the start of lockdown, you started to see a lot of people adapt, uh, adopt these new platforms, sorry, but they, were, they weren't optimizing them properly. So as long as you commit to it, put a bit of time and effort into it, you can take your, you know, your horizontal video, make them vertical, shorten them, tighten them up, and then you can use them for a whole different variety of, of things. And you can make one event last two or three months in yeah. terms of digital media content in, in, as part of your strategy. Um, I, mean, I do something similar to this with my uh, podcasts. So w- you know, when we're done with this, we'll, we'll, we'll put the v- video version on YouTube, We'll take the audio and put that onto, you know, Spotify, Amazon, all that stuff. And then some clever person downstairs will ch- find some wisdom in what we're saying and go, that's a really interesting soundbite. Mm-hmm. Cut it up and put uh, bars on it. And and it's like, hang on a minute. Mm-hmm. One thing, I mean, we'll talk for whatever, half an hour, well, maybe a bit longer than that. Once, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll witter on and it'll get cut down. But, um, you know, an hour's worth of content used to be like one thing. But now we're like, no, 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 let's plan this right. We've got TikToks out of it. We've got social media posts out of it. We've got podcasts. Mm -hmm. So so the the spin on recording something like this is like, um, you know, if I think about in kind of the uh, world I work in, somebody trying to put together a LinkedIn post, it might mm-hmm. take them an hour, an hour and a half to come up with something. Meanwhile, we'll spend an hour and probably get 10, 10 or so snippets out of it of some like nuggets that are useful. Mm-hmm. We've got 10 of them. Yeah, I think so. I, lo- I, I think video is most effective online, especially on platforms like LinkedIn, where you do have that little 30, 40 second clip you have the you know amazingly written copy on the, in the post, but then it's the it's the media that's going to catch the attention and just also reinforce the point that's made. So, you know, have you ever had? It could be a call to action. It could just be some in, information. It could just be here's a life lesson learned, a behind the scenes story. Here's my story, but also here it is in video, so they can digest it. I prefer watching video as a as a person. I'm a you know I'm a dyslexic. Um, so my, I've never been super academic with my writing, but I can express myself and articulate myself at a much better standard if I did it presenting. So mm-hmm. video for me is the best way for me to communicate my thoughts. And like, I love voice notes on WhatsApp because um, mm-hmm. it takes away all my barriers to communicate. And it doesn't matter if I've spelt something wrong, or if I've got the wrong tense or I've used the wrong bit of punctuation or grammar because people understand what I'm saying. And again, it just, that just goes back to the context that we spoke about earlier. You can hear how I'm saying it. You can understand how I'm saying it. There's no miscommunication. So, so your journey in con- the content creatives. So, what you've done is kind of like, um, how do I put it? So, there's people doing video themselves. Mm-hmm. There's people hiring freelancers to to make stuff. Mm-hmm. There's then. The kind of Hollywood production with the, you know, the producer and the uh, the script writer and all that kind of, you know, big uh, razzle dazzle, yeah. razzle dazzle budget stuff. Mm-hmm. And you've kind of deliberately, as content creatives, put yourselves as the middle, the step from using a freelance videographer mm-hmm. towards something that's a bit more produced. Um, with that kind of planning of this would make a great TikTok video, this would make this. So you're kind of sitting in the middle. Mm-hmm. What kind of the projects are you doing in, at the moment and, and where are you seeing the real value pieces out of some of the stuff you're doing? So, yeah, I, I, an ideal client for us is someone who understands video, likes the idea of video, maybe an enthusiast themselves but don't have the resources, the time or the equipment to kind of maybe produce the level of stuff that they they particularly want Um, because they understand what they want. They can communicate that quite clearly to us and we use our resources to to help them take that next step. Um, But also trying to involve people that want to use video as part of their marketing strategy because video is very good at helping deliver results on strategies if they're super, you know, superly finely worked out, detailed, aimed at a particular niche, 
knowing that your target audience is looking for what it is you're trying to put out there. Video is very good at connecting people for the reasons that we, we've discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so for some of our clients, um, working with repeat clients on their events. So some of our clients we've been working with three or four years now and each year because we can offer we can offer them the they know that the value that we can bring them now we can kind of add a little bit uh of extra content so i've been one of my clients that um i started working with during lockdown was greenwich and betsy hospice um and they obviously were hit really hard because it's really hard to crowdfund in, in lockdown so i was helping them produce some content around virtual crowdfunding things that people could be doing for them they gave me some of their existing footage we edited that up put it out there to advertise the virtual mini marathon run or the Santa dash um, instead of being able to do the big all singing or dancing ones. Um, we then went and filmed two years ago. We went to their first in-person one where there was only a couple of hundred people just because of numbers, but also did people, you know, people weren't exactly coming out into society full force because we didn't know where we were heading in between lockdowns. Um, but off the basis of that content, um, we produced some great, uh, video um, they use that straight afterwards and then this year they had um, they went from 200 300 runners to nearly uh, 900 runners wow. because they were able to use that content to go to schools to tell people you know we are still doing it this is what it was last year it sparked the interest got people connected they instantly like nearly trebled their audience and then this year because of that we had a bigger crew so i was able to cover more angles we could cover more stories i could do some interviews um, to give them as well as making the the montage videos afterwards Um, and now they're already planning um they want to have a meet with me in a few weeks to plan what else we can try and do next year to try and up the production value because they have seen that their event is grown exponentially using video Mm. Um, and it's always really nice to hear when people say oh my gosh, the video that we did last time had such good reaction. It's made it so much easier. I want to do more. And they're the sort of people we want to work with because they know the value. It's just about trying to find what the sweet spot is in terms of what level of coverage they might need. Um, Another one of our clients uh, that we work with regularly, we do a mixture of, um, so I said, like I called it Vava Voom in their Zoom call. So they would send us um, the live feed from an event. We... Um, designed a, I called it a skin. That's just the word I use for it. But basically, we put a graphic around the footage so it doesn't look like a really, you know, super stretch, grainy zoom call. It's smaller, it's in the middle, but it's got a dedicated uh, graphic design around it. So we can put text, we put subtitles on it, um, like captions, so people could follow with uh, audio on or off. Um, and it just makes it more appealing to the eye. Um, we've done stuff with them in in person as well now um um, who else one of our other clients that um we kind of did a hybrid so they had a in-person event in a cinema screening where i had to make a three-hour edit um to do to show in their their cinema screening for world Mental health day but that actually came from two full days of filming podcasts so they were recording the audio but we filmed it at the same time similar to this like a round table setup we filmed loads of spoken word performances um they had uh, five or six discussion panels so i edited all of them in full gave it to them they gave me the bits they wanted and we basically made the highlight reel um of wow. three hours from about 10 12 hours of footage um so you could watch say the then i made a uh a little reel of the day so about 60 seconds here's a, here's a snippet of everything to entice and engage and get people to click onto the onto the site and then they could choose what they wanted to watch after that um so that's kind of some of the and each year it gets bigger because they see the value. They want to try and reach more people. They want to get a higher production quality. And I really love that because I love my medium and I love that other people are starting to love it as much as I do and can see the value in getting their messages out there. And I think as well, if you've got, if you've got good substantive content, you know, um, I remember somebody said to me, um, that if you've got good content, you you should rinse it. Yes, content is king is something that I used to hear a lot when I was at university and uh, talking with marketing professionals. And it is true. I think it's not always about the quantity. It is about the quality um, and not always about the actual quality of the video. Like I say, some of the 
some of someone just taking out their iPhone and filming the behind the scenes of a high production value shoot can get just as much engagement if they use it and target it in the right way as that sh- as the, the the actual video itself. Um, one of the projects I've been working on with one of our larger clients, um, I pitched to them during lockdown. They wanted a corporate glossy video because mm-hmm. their brand is that's what people expect from their brand. And I went, that's great. But can I can I pitch some you know home shot vlog diary room style content? So I I, I taught their team um, with what, my, like big big brother kind of diary room. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of how I, I pitched it basically as um, diary room content talking into your mobile. So it's very similar framing to what we're doing now, but they're in their own environment where they're discussing their work and their journey, but in a place that's natural to them. Um, and uh, my shoot was like six months. The in-person shoot, the the, the corporate shoot, was about six months um, into the future. So I use this as an opportunity to get to know people, um, get them used to talking on camera. And when it comes to the in-person shoot, we had like the best half-hour chat ever um, because they already knew who I was. I knew enough about them to ask them the right questions, to get the right sign ba- sign- sound bites for the client. Um, and it just made the whole experience really pleasurable. So I took away that um uh nervousness about being vulnerable and being on camera um and i thought that was brilliant and i'm i'm also giving them um to support that video in their internal launch it's, it's an internal project it's not external unfortunately but so that's going to everyone in their organization globally and mm-hmm. part of that will be um here's the five or six people we spoke to they also have their own story shot from their own smartphones in their mm-hmm. own at their own desk if you're interested so Again, just trying to find their stories because what mm. what we were discussing is a a really good tool for their employees to use in the business. But if some people aren't interested in the high glossy stuff like myself, then this is a way to try and get mass penetration in the organization mm. of if you like the glossy stuff, here's the glossy video. But if you want to see more raw, rustic, organic people just being honest and talking to them, their camera in a diary start. Uh, diary room format then here's that here's that content for you as well so i'm looking forward to seeing how that um that works out when i get the data i think as well i mean in-person events we've got two three in-person events this year and we're relatively nervous about them because it feels new and different and we've got to learn it again online and you know the, the marketing piece is far more i think you have to invest more in the marketing now to get people to come to an in-person than you did before Mm. um just because if you can do it online people will rather do it online so it has to be extra special experience that people are coming and deciding to the hassle of traveling somewhere (laughs) yes but i I was thinking about this because you uh, you and rob uh, came and filmed some of our events before the P word. Yes. And um, one of the things we found is that, you know, what separates an event is is looking at faces and rooms and, and the, seeing the energy that's going on in an event. And it strikes me that a lot of organizations, as they go back to in-person, they're going to have this scenario where all of their footage from previous ones might be out of date. Mm-hmm. You know, technologies, even, even in the last three years, most people are now doing things in 4k. And I think three years ago, two years ago, 4k wasn't necessarily as common as it is now mm-hmm. that actually filming an event. I mean, we don't think about this filming an event. Like if I film an event now, it's actually the marketing collateral for the next one. Yes. Yes. It's the online teasers for yep. that event. Yes. So so what I do with the event right now will actually help me set up the next one. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's that and that's why I think the, the word strategy is important with uh, trying to connect with clients that want to use video as a strategy because if you've never done an event before. The first one is it's the investment in this will make the second one better because you're making that buzz. You're, you know, mm-hmm. creating the FOMO, the fear of missing out, um, smiley faces, people networking, um, showing off the venue, whatever it may be. Um, if there's food, if there's, you know, drinks, whatever it may be, you've got to create that connect, emotional connection to 
or spark and, and the excitement can, to make people want to go. We can spot stock. Yes, yes. We I'm can spot that. stock. And yes. when you do kind of promotional content, I you know I find right, and I I'm gonna I'm talking about this now, and literally in about half an hour, forty five minutes time, I've got to prep for this. When I'm when you do promos, oh, oh, my light's gone. Set still for too long. There we go. When you do promos, this is the uh, the benefits of doing it in real time. Um, when you do promos, if you haven't got stock footage, you end up either trying to fake promos, right, which never work well, mm. or you end up doing promos where you're talking to camera, which don't go across as well. But like, um, I don't want to use video term, but when you when you're filming an event, you take rushes, don't you? You yes. just the camera just does its stuff, and then you're oh, we're going to make a promo. That shot of doing somebody really focused on stage and the audience listening to him, and the sound bite all coming in create amazing promos. Mm. But if you don't do it, you haven't got it. Yes, and to be fair, a lot of our clients that have come to us they're like we want we've got an event but we you know the first question we ask is have you got any previous footage and they go no that's what we want to change i'm like okay great that's great you've taken the first step we can definitely help you the benefit will come second third event because you need to build up the catalog um there is nothing wrong with stock footage uh, people can make a really good living out of it but like you say it's not you it's not your personality you're using someone else's vision of that particular room um and it is all very sort of corporate um yeah. same for photography um it doesn't bring the music. flavor of the event yeah it, it doesn't have your it doesn't have your stamp on it at all um mm. there's nothing wrong with doing that for the first one but still shoot the video at the actual event to then go actually this is what it does look like this is what the it feels like do you want to come along mm. um but yeah it's just the continuation in of of using a strategy for every event you do collecting some content you don't have to necessarily film every event you can just have you could maybe have some, some photographs or or a small team but some events you know your big marquee events that's when you should put some effort in because sometimes um what i've had with some clients and spoke to other people in the industry is um you can invest your resources potentially in the wrong particular product so um if you if you were to film every event and you do lots of little events, but you have that one massive annual conference, you should probably put most of your resources towards that big annual conference. But you need to put some resources, two or three, uh, or the smaller events beforehand to build the buzz to make that yeah. uh, event uh, as big as and as good as it can be. Um, where if you sort of blow all your budget too early on in the little ones, then you're not going to get the, the mm -hmm. return there. So. Um, I just like discussing with people and say like, what you, what do you want to achieve? What are your goals? What are your targets? And then we can suggest different ways of achieving that. So it could just be some social media content. It doesn't always have to go online. You could just go, I, ju I want you to film it all. It's an internal, it's an internal um, for the panels, but I want to see some interviews and some Vox Pops and some talking heads to go on the social. So you don't also have to release it urgently. You can hold on to it for the whole year if you're going to do an annual one and then you've just got the strategy two three months in advance so it takes that stress off yeah no i think i think you're bang on there you, you before you go into it you've got to have a plan of you know not just oh we're going to film it and then you know I, i'm not being critical to a freelancer but often you hear you know if you hire a freelancer they'll be a camera operator yeah a that really good one as well but that's that all, can, that's what they do that can edit maybe yeah and so what you're doing is you're getting somebody who's really good at the shots and then they say so what do you want with it yeah and then you know there are some that double hand that but actually then you're the director of the promo yeah yeah exactly. whereas what you what you really want is somebody to to, to kind of say okay what do we want to get out of this let's you know that kind of hybrid again between doing it yourself and just filming stuff and going what are we going to make of it the step is get somebody to film it who can film better than you mm -hmm. and then up here you've got actually 
Hollywood production or ITV production where they come along and go, yeah, we want this angle, this angle, this angle, and we've spent a million quid doing it. Mm-hmm. And you guys in the middle going, we want TikTok videos, we want we want some um, um, mini training videos, we want some YouTube videos out of it, we want let's break every session up, but every session could be a little YouTube video. And then go, now we film it knowing we're going to do this. Yeah, it's just, it's really important to have, how are you going to use it and who's it for as well? The the other big thing that people don't always think about when making their own video content is they've got an amazing idea. They can execute it pretty well on the, by themselves or employing a freelancer or or a team of people. But, if those people aren't challenging you on what is the story, who's it for, and where's it going to go, you could totally miss that vital piece. So you've done this great video, but then you don't know how to target people, or you don't know who actually to target it at, and then you kind of waste a lot of time and resource pushing it out there when really you only, you know, if you would have thought about it a bit longer, I had a bit more of a strategy meeting around it. You go, I'm just going to use this for. Uh, TikTok. So, okay, TikTok allows no more than 10 minute videos, but ideally about 30 second videos. Mm-hmm. So I don't need to shoot a two hour uh, corporate video because you won't be able to upload that onto TikTok in the way that TikTok would want you to. Um, and therefore you'll just totally miss the the audience and the message that you want to get out. It just mm-hmm. fades out with the buzz of everything else. I was just saying, I was thinking as well, what, one of the residual benefits, like, you know, if you're hosting an event and you've got some some guest speakers with an audience. Um, Obviously, if you can shoot them beforehand, fantastic. Mm. But if you can't, you've got that residual buzz post-event marketing Mm -hmm. of actually let's cut some really good soundbite snippets of that speaker landing really insightful information. Yep. Give them to them. Yep. And they become part of your marketing team. Yep, hundred um, percent. We we've done something quite similar in the past. We when we hosted so the event we hosted to get young people into digital uh, media uh, employment. Uh, each of the panelists um, we knew in some uh, either pretty well or we'd known from association or other projects. So we would selected all the panelists. We made them a speaker reel um, that they could, you know, under a minute, they could put it on their social media. We, we release it. We tag them on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, whatever platform you use. And they're, they're going to like it, aren't they? Cause it's nice and it's promo for them. So it's trying to, trying to how, how we can use the content to allow someone else to push it on your behalf. Exactly the way you said. So if you do a speaker reel, um, or you offer a, a golden bit of advice from X and X an expert, of course, they're going to like it, engage it, share it, you know, and then also that helps you build your relationship with them. They're going to remember you because a lot of people that do speaking, like Rob, uh, one of my business partners, he's done uh, speaking around the world. And one thing he was his biggest regret was when when we first met, I was like, oh, have you got any footage of this or pictures? Because that's always my go-to question. Can I see it? Because I like to see things. And he's like, no, I don't. It's really, it's really sad, actually um because that was a great venue and there was like a thousand people there or yeah but seeing is believing and that, that's why video is just so amazing so the <laughs> funny story of how i met rob by the way so i met um i met danny's one of danny's business partners in romania uh we were both speaking at a conference and i didn't think it was as big a conference as as it was made i don't know if you know this story so I thought I was going to this little conference with like 15, 20 people or something. And they were just, you know, and I get there, meet Rob. We go out for dinner and uh, another speaker there I met for the first time, go out for dinner. And then we, the next day we go see it. I came in later than everybody else. So the next day we go see it and there's this huge video wall, huge video wall. And like, I don't know, seven, eight hundred seats. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that you said workshop. So I'm thinking 20 people. So I had a keynote on this day. And actually, the only pictures I've got is what Rob took. So Rob Good took the pictures of it. Um, but you're 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 right. I mean, when you've got when you've got events like this, you've got to capture it, not just for the, oh, that was nice. We have to remember it for the history books. It's like no, no, that piece of video is an asset you need to sweat. Mm-hmm. 
hundred percent. It's market. It's marketing for that event, as you say, post event, get a bit more of a buzz, get more people signed up to your mailing list, and then repurpose it slightly. You know, whatever the duration is in between the next event and that one, you just re, you know recycle, repurpose some of that content again to push for the next one. Um, and you've already obviously got the buy in from the people that were there first time. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, and it's great. It, and it- if you've got, if you're, one of the things I've found, I'm uh, going into my topic really a little bit, but when you're on social media and you do a video straight to camera, it doesn't get the engagement as well as when when we're talking um, or when I'm doing something downstairs in our little studio mm-hmm. and I might be on a podcast where the cameras are at an angle and it doesn't look like I'm just talking to the camera like a, you know, like a TV presenter, they seem to do really well. Hmm, interesting. I don't know whether you, have you spotted this, like the podcast, I know I'm looking straight down the camera, but I'm actually trying to look at you at the same time. You're kind of yeah. like slightly off there, so I should be looking here really. But when, have you, I don't know whether you've noticed this, I'll just pull my microphone up, and, and uh, it, Matt, I hate this, I can never get this microphone in the right position. <laughs> but when you're doing like this, you see loads of people on TikTok talking like this, mm. and those videos seem to do really well. So, I have a few thoughts on that. Really, I suppose I I was reading a was I reading and then watching a video attached to the blog, um, power of video, um, a thing around TikTok is aimed around Gen Zers, mm-hmm. correct? So they were. I saw a, I saw a series of memes that actually brought me to the blog, and then obviously they had a video, and basically they were discussing that is how um, this generation are quite happy with really uh, unconventional framing, where they're kind of like this, and you're like, what on earth are they looking at, or what on earth are they doing? But because it just feels like you're on FaceTime, I think that that particular generation feel more connected to that content. Me personally, I like looking into the eyes of someone because as a storyteller, I'm talking mm-hmm. to the person who's viewing it, so my my preference is always looking into camera to present the message if you're going to do a talking head shot but i also love the standard sort of second camera interview which is what you've just done where you're kind of like that and that complements a head-on angle really you know really well which is why tv shows news outlets um go for that sort of two two camera setup um the second thing really is it just depends who your audience is some people don't like being spoken to um, mm-hmm. So if you're talking directly at them, um, they can be switched off because they prefer just being involved in a conversation, even though you're talking to yourself. But because you're not actually directing it at them, they feel like they're just taking it in um, and they're not feeling like they're under pressure to have to to listen and, and be heard. Um, but We like to look in on things, though, don't we? Yeah, don't I suppose think. that's kind of like that behind-the-scenes-esque of it. Um, again, it, it depends. Like, if you want to... TV adverts will always talk directly to you because you want to talk to the people. But also something that I made some video content around um, during lockdown. Um, lockdown one, we did a little series on how to help people shoot some stuff at home. The the big thing where I do see people sometimes miss their messages because of the framing. So if you are going to look directly at someone, you can either be head on, which is natural conversation, and you, you're considered equal in the conversation. If you're slightly higher and you're looking down into the camera, it kind of, it's more intimidating to the person because it you're, it looks like you're looking down on them, like they've done something wrong, like you're in, you know, you're superior, they're inferior. And then the opposite of that is if they look up, that makes them look inferior. So why am I listening to you? And, you know, so um, just by having your framing right tells, you know, tells people exactly, well, it gives off a vibe of what they should be yeah. expecting. So if you want to treat people like equals, you look directly down the lens. And that's why, um, you know, at school, people sit in their chairs, the teacher stands, because you look up to the teacher, physically look up. So they have that element of you're more important, you have this high status. So some people can go off on a 10 minute rant on something, but because they're looking down at you, you can kind of take that negatively. So if you have the angle where you break that kind of eye line contact, it just feels like you're at the pub now and you're actually in the conversation, although I'm talking to myself. That's 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 really interesting. And I guess that's part of what you've got to do when you're looking at a video project for a client. You're kind of looking at, okay, how do we make sure that this lands? Not just yes. we capture it, it's 4K or 
HD or whatever you're doing, but you've not just got the TikTok and you've got the um, the YouTube clip it snippets and all that kind of stuff. But actually, you end up with something that people want to watch. Yeah, my job is really to think like the consumer or create content or f- explore stories that if I am the target audience, what would I want to know? Um, so yeah, we do. We you know we can do glossy brand pieces, you know, TV adverts, as it were, social media ads, but I'm more interested in that sort of supporting content. And this is where it, applying this to events really works. So some people might want to sit through a 45 minute lecture, but they'll happily sit through a five minute answer on a particular subject they're, they're intrigued by, which is why they wanted to go. Um, so it's trying to find the different ways to attract people, you know, get them feeling excited about the content, wanting to in, engage with the content and then ultimately share it because obviously you want them to distribute your message on uh on your behalf so um it's trying to think how we can engage different people different ways and you can have a a one-day shoot like an event or a corporate shoot where you just shoot you know different types of content to try and hit as many people in your target audience as possible Mm-hmm. But it takes a lot of thought and, again, strategy, not to try and keep yeah. throwing the word strategy out there, but video is best used when you have a strategy behind it. Yeah, and it makes sense if you're if – you're, if you love video but maybe don't have the bandwidth to do it, you can't be an afterthought. Uh, yeah. Like, like, uh, like, oh, it's more difficult. Film, come yeah. film it, and, and you have somebody filming it, but, but really you, you want to film it for filming its sake, but – I guess you're looking for shots. Yeah. So, uh, in personal experience, I've I've spent uh, with two of our well, best friends in filmmaking. Uh, we spent five years making a documentary, and um, I was doing a Q and A last week at the Romford Film Festival. And one of the questions was, "How easy was it to edit?" And I was like, "We shot eighty hours of footage, and that's because our story went across three, four year period." But also things changed. We didn't know. We knew we wanted to do the documentary on micropubs, but we didn't know exactly what story we wanted to tell. So we had to just get sheer volume of content, and then we had to do all of the editing afterwards. Now it's so much easier to make a documentary if you know exactly what you want to say. Only have five hours to make that one hour, but when you've got eighty hours, it obviously just drags it out. So, and you know, we're professionals. We know what we wanted to do. We just we just couldn't agree on how it's best to tell that story. So it had to kind of evolve over time. Um, that's, and that's, that's the same thing. If you shoot it yourself, you could spend days, weeks, months trying to work out, well, actually, I should have said this question or I should have answered it this way. And then it's kind of, you missed your, you've missed your opportunity because the shoot's already happened. Um, mm-hmm. It becomes a lot more tricky to try and tell your story because, again, it could have changed. Mm-hmm. And that, But that's that's true of anything. I mean, I, I go on to, I do live sessions every week and I go on to a live session and I have my notes and then I review what I've actually said. And I was like, I was, it bears no resemblance, but also you have the other things. And I shouldn't say this cause I probably ruined my career, but sometimes you say things that was like, just throw away statement that was like a, a mic drop moment. Yeah. Just really resonates with you. Yeah. Uh- yeah, but you, but you you because you're in the middle of it, you just don't know what you've said. Yes, but as the person watching out for the end result, if you focus on it, you go, you, you know, you can gauge the room, you can see how the audience responded, the way the dynamics work, but you just drive, you, you know, as a speaker, you just browse past it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think with with events, especially with in-person live events, um, like in the room live, not streaming, um, is that interaction between people, being able to bounce off people. Like I am a people person, so I struggle to connect with people um, as quickly if we're doing things remotely through the screen because I'm very, much, I'm very physical. I talk, I, I use my hands a lot, um, so and I kind of vibe off people. Um, and it's so, so I, I really struggle when I'm in an environment where I can't be, you know, me, when you can only see this much of me, um, that's not, that's not doing me a true justice. So when you're doing in-person events, you might have the plan. You can, if you're doing a panel, you can have your five questions, but after question two, they might say something really interesting. You get that live rebuttal 
you can mm-hmm. then you can then go off and all of that can be used as content although it's not exactly on your list you can still go ask those three yeah. questions later but you've just got that golden nugget of extra value you can offer your audience yeah. because of like say a throwaway comment or you say something and you go oh actually that was interesting and then um and i just think it's easier to have that sort of natural spark if you're in in front of people physically with people um mm-hmm. you can do it online but then if you have to type it out or you have to wait for them to gain their attention um, the moment goes you lose yeah the and then it's like oh actually you said something really interesting five minutes ago but it took you five minutes to saw that i typed in the group chat or whatever else mm-hmm. um so and, and yeah. it takes a real skill to be warm on camera in an empty room yeah you, you're basically having to put your shoes in sort of like a, become an actor like you've mm-hmm. got to try and g yourself up to kind of keep the energy enthusiasm because at the end of the day as you just saw earlier like the lights turned off because i hadn't moved so the motion sensor didn't think i was hit like there is if you're sitting there you're quite confined to the you know the square inch of whatever your screen is um it's hard to keep yourself motivated because you're used to being out and in person um but don't get me wrong i've recorded and edited lots of great um online events but uh they're normally they normally do better if it's more of like an educational or fact-based sort of presentation stuff. If you want to do like networking, it's just not got the same, the same sort of vibe. No, no, it's, it's, it, it, it feels a little strange for me. Um, I, I prefer in person because I think there's a, I'm speaking from a, from a, you know, a speaker's point of view, because I, that's primarily what I'm at events doing Mm -hmm. is you can look people in the eyes and you can see how they're responding, and if they're engaged, you can. It, it gives you a boost yeah. of energy if you see other people engaging, and if you see, you know, it's weird how humans respond, isn't it? If you see that kind of, it either means they're really focused or they're confused. In which case, you get the signal of going, "I'm talking over the heads. So I need to re-emphasize a point or say it in a different way." Yeah, yeah, rephrase what you're saying to to get the engagement. But I mean, that from a communication point of view regardless of if it, you've been recorded or not, uh, at least you, you're constantly re- redefining and re-classifying uh, mm. what you're trying to say because obviously at the end of the day, if you're trying to tell a story, they have to understand what it is you're mm. trying to tell them. Yeah, and that's got to. Co- that's not just in the room. That's how it comes out on the video afterwards. Yes. Because a lo- you, you can lose a lot of that... Um, um, energy if you don't do the video you know you don't capture the footage in the right way the one annoying thing for me is when when you get to a, a conference and it's online and you you know you're watching a pre-record some of them you can't skip and you've got this whole waffle at the front end of the fire escapes and all this stuff and it's like that didn't need to be there yeah just get me to the bit that i wanted to watch yeah yeah 100% um i have seen that by the way a, an online replay where no you can't skip it you have to watch the whole thing so then you can't come back to it and it's like oh that's so annoying. are you telling me i'm going to come in and you want me to watch a 45 minute thing start to finish oh and by the way if i leave i have to start the gear at the beginning again and watch that same woman talk about the conference agenda, the fire escapes. I was like, oh. oh. So I suppose, yeah, so that will come down to, for me, the delivery delivery strategy of how it's going to be consumed by your your target audience that, you know, Rob and Ben have both sent me examples of online uh, um, events where they have like 45 minutes of eh, waiting for the live feed to start. And you're like, that's on YouTube. And that's 45, you know, they had to skip 45 minutes in to even find when it started. Why mm-hmm. couldn't you just have 10 seconds of that? And you know what I mean? Like, say 45 minutes of someone's life. Um, so the strategy part there kind of fell apart because obviously they ran behind and they just had to put a live feed out to let people know that there is something happening at some point, but no visual cues on the screen. Uh, events starting soon or we've been delayed. It, yeah, it's even, just there. Even just the agenda going up to say... Yeah, just something, just something to vibe off. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. So, so you're really busy uh, now that the world's opening back up with events and and helping people leverage the video 
that they they've either already got or they're about to create. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see? What do you see as the 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 way events are going to go? Are you seeing more in person, more hybrid, uh, lots of virtual? How are you seeing that split at the moment? Are you seeing more people ditching virtual to go back to in person? I think from conversations we have with with clients, people are still kind of in that. I'm not sure, as you kind of alluded to earlier, you've got events, you're not 100% sure. Um, The only way we're going to know is by, if you're going to try the in-person, I think you just have to commit to one. Um, And because obviously it's the stress of trying to arrange an event, whether it's virtual, hybrid, in-person, they all have their different challenges. Um, You don't want to add extra pressure on yourself to, think which one am I got you know two weeks before the event is it going to be uh is it going to be in person or is it going to be remote um people are being more active and more social which is a good thing because I think obviously in the lockdown years we lost a lot of interaction with other people um and people have kind of forgot I think how to be around larger groups of people like the etiquette like we've just got to learn it again like you know i see it in shops or whatever people just kind of they seem a little bit edgy and a bit rusty when they're trying to communicate with people um but in person in person get can get you sort of better live feel vibe content so it's worth doing one just to get that in the bag and if your audience weren't feeling it you can always go back to hybrid or fully remote um if you're getting, if you're not getting as much engagement with your remote or vir- um, or virtual ones, then maybe try doing the the in person because you've just got to give it a go. But a lot of people are kind of they're unsure, and we just go, you've just got to commit to one because we can't. The strategy is slightly different, video wise, and what messages you're wanting to tell depending on what kind of event you're going to have. Um, because if it is virtual, then all your content is going to look virtual. So as I say, we can put nice graphic design works around it, put text on screen captions. Um, but if your next event isn't going to be that, you you have to start planning how can we do, maybe do hybrid so you can get some, as you say, pre-recorded talking heads or someone live in one place and then they cut to virtual another date. Um, but yeah, I suppose the split is kind of 50-50 really still but more people are telling us they want to do more in person this summer. Um, Mm. So we'll just have to see. I mean, I obviously prefer in person because I'm a people person. I love being there. The thrill of the event live is, it's great. Um, Remote has its other challenges um, and other things that I like, like I can work wherever I currently am. I don't have to be in that particular room, Um, but I prefer being in person. And I think in person is always going to offer you best value, um and better content just because of the interactiveness and the live nature of it yeah and i think i think as well despite us having in this country anyway rel- re- generally good broadband you still yes. can't predict what's going to happen on the day <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, if you are doing it in person like you said there's nothing wrong with having the camera team doing the live stuff but also you could still be streaming it in the back so you can cater to the people that still aren't 100 percent committed to coming out or having to travel the length of the country to come to the event um so you can still cater for both both uh audiences um and create you know uh, unique content for both audiences um, and that's what I try to push more because, again, it's more about depending on what the client wants. If it's an internal thing, it doesn't really matter about trying to get it out there online. It's about how we can connect best to their employees. Um, if you're trying to get, if you've got an event like a trade show or whatever, and you want general public to buy into it, then we can make it. There's got to be a lot of excitement and energy if you're trying to get people to do something. Yes. Yeah, you, ne- you need to get them connected emotionally get the excitement spark something to be yeah like the fear of missing out it's like i've got to go to the next one because that just looked amazing yeah. um and yeah you with video you can you can tell these exciting sort of stories and these fancy shots and uh you know editing wizardry to help um gain the interest for your next event mm. no i i'm i'm really i'm really excited about events i really am coming back to in person I'm a bit nervous because it's like you forget the art of promoting them as well. Yeah. Okay. You know, but uh, we'll find our feet with it. But it, it, 
I think there's nothing better than interacting with people and, and people like video to non-video video you know being in the room with with it is amazing uh, but then the teases you get from it the amount of people who've come back and said when they've seen a video of something we've done and yeah. gone i would have never have known about that and from my point of view i've seen it yeah. where mm. I write the blog and then do the video and people say the video was so helpful. I'm like, yeah, but the blog's been out for ages. Why do you need the video? And it's like, no, it's just a different level of understanding once you see it rather than read it. Yeah. Uh, just everyone is different. Uh, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I think I said that properly. I said I'm a bit dyslexic. Um, so I like visually seeing, watching, doing. So that's probably why I am in the practical job of, making video and shooting films because it you it's really hard to do that sort of remotely to the mm -hmm. standards that um I'd, i like to to work at um some people do prefer reading and that's great you know they can they can just absorb that but people like me i don't have a short attention span as such but i would rather watch a two-minute video than read a 10-page document mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people in the world of you know social media and you know 15 second tiktoks video is only going to become more important to get your message across quickly um we're, we're almost we're, we're almost entering an era where you know i think we're in the similar generation i don't want to insult you but i think we're in a similar generation um where we grew up with everything was books yeah and then we went through this phase of no 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 video books no yeah. no no video books uh, yep. video is bad for you books and now we're in this place where it's video oh you read books yeah interesting i, I know yeah. i you know audio books you know people listening to books people like watching like people read books even yes yeah yeah it's watching not... a video of someone reading your book yeah yeah my my son watches people playing games and now i see people watching videos of other people watching videos uh, it's interesting isn't it but people love it like again yeah it's not I my was, exact cup of tea but people love it i was an absolute saddo last night i watched a lawyer watching the johnny depp amber heard we'll not get into that bit okay. but a lawyer I'm a bit behind <laughs> a lawyer watching the johnny depp amber heard thing and then talking about it or kind of like those live commentary things yeah. yeah i mean that's actually a whole different well a whole new genre i think that i've sort of come across on youtube now i know a few few of my friends they have a chat show essentially or it's, it's a watch along so i know someone who does it with football he supports a certain team he will watch every team live stream from his from his little studio um and he's commenting on the game and then his friends are there and he's just chatting his opinions he gets his friends on um so that is that's a new kind of genre of video that I didn't know existed, probably pre lockdown years, um, but that well really strong community stuff basically. If you can find the community, then those sort of things are super fun and lucrative. Like these game, you know, these gamers millionaires uh -huh. before they're twenty because it's, not, it's a bit like the um, unboxing videos, isn't it? Yeah, Watching yeah. People unbox something. <laughs> yeah, or, well, just. The quirky, I think as well with video, just the quirky niches you can have. I think there's a channel on Twitter that I come across every now and again, and it's basically a drill that squashes things. And it's like, what should oh, we squash next? Yeah, yeah so it'll be like yeah. Barbie doll versus whatever this drill is. And it'll be like 10 seconds of Barbie getting crushed. And like, what next? And people love it. It's millions of yeah. views. I've, like, seen, I've you're... seen one I've seen one like that where they crush a bowling ball. Oh, wow. I bet that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the other one is... Uh, uh, so I'm, I watch hot metal being poured onto things. Oh, okay. Yeah. So no, they melt it up into okay. like a little pot and then they pour it on things to see how it long is. it can hold it. Like they poured one into like, um, like a glass bowl and I was surprised how long the glass like fish bowl thing held up against molten metal and then it just went... <sighs> And then, uh, you know, plastic containers and all this kind of stuff. 
Interesting. Oh, I've not seen that one. I must yeah. admit, I think I spent, I watched a, a six minute video. I did, it didn't feel like six minutes on Facebook the other day of um, these, it was a building site video. So just finding quirky things. It was a, it must have been a big one. And it was basically eight different marbles. They made like a rat run and they just let these marbles go. And the guy was doing a commentary like it was a horse race. And I found it fascinating. I couldn't help it. I'm just watching marbles run around this dirt track. For six minutes, I went, I can't believe I just watched that. I was enthralled by it. I think, you know, just the video just allows you to like just get into these really weird niche story and communities and people love it. Yeah. You can be you. I think video just allows you to be you. It's a, it's a really good platform for communicating wherever you want and people are quite happy to generate content off the back of it and wherever else, whether it be pouring mar- molten metal or frying marbles down different you know, rat runs or crushing things with a drill. Like you couldn't write about that. It wouldn't sound exciting as an audio piece, but the seeing, you know, seeing it in action video makes it magical. Mm. Yeah. Um, Danny, it's been awesome to have you on. Um, I think we've learned a lot about video. Um, best way to reach you, um, LinkedIn website, where's the best place to reach you if the people's thinking about a video project? Uh, so yeah, either my, my LinkedIn, Danny Icott, um, E-Y-C-O-T-T, or you can go to the content, the content creatives website, um, uh, www.contentcraves.co.uk. Um, and, um, yeah, I'd love to have a chat. I just like having chats with people, exploring ideas, a little bit of education, like in a nice way, just by like, these are the sort of things we can do. Cause a lot of people just don't know what they can do with things. So mm-hmm. Um, I just like exploring options with people. And there's definitely a, 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 a gap. There's a gap in the market for that. We, we don't want Hollywood, but we want a bit more than one person with a camera. Yeah, we, we you know, I like to think that we make high quality products um, at affordable um, pricing for people that want to use video as an ongoing strategy. Um, so if you want to do video long term or like over a number of months, over a number of years, um, where you can see bigger return on the investment of using video. Um, I think we offer a really nice product. It looks nice. It's shot well. Crew a lovely professional. And we also make it a fun experience. I take the stress of the project away from you, but we make it fun. I make it as interactive as you want it. If you want to be on set, we can have a laugh and get the stuff done. If you just want to leave us to it and follow the script that's been signed off and we agree on, we can do that as well. You know, I just, it's, I just want to make people happy and enjoy the process as much as I do. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This was totally unscripted, so you did it really well, considering you didn't know anything that was coming from me. Oh, thank you. Um, It was exciting. (laughs) So uh, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, Go check out Danny on LinkedIn. I'll put his details around wherever you're watching or listening to this. And uh, I'll see you on the next edition of the podcast.